Welcome to day eight of our 12 days of Act 10. Today we're going to focus on trade, uh, just the basics. So we'll do another video on trade uh, for tomorrow and build on what we learned today. But it's important to first get the basics down really well because these problems can get pretty complicated. But as long as you take it back to basics, they shouldn't be too difficult. It'll just take a little bit of time. So our starting point is to ask why in a market without trade do we always end up with QS equal QD? Why is that our equilibrium condition? And basically, like in most of our arguments in economics, where we use this you know equality condition and said we have to be have an equality, we just considered the two other possibilities. We said suppose QS was greater than QD. So there was like a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of stuff at the market, like for instance, those new Amazon Fire phones and hardly any people in the market wanted to buy them. So there was 100,000 phones and only 20,000 buyers. So there was a big excess, QS much greater than QD. Well, then what's going to happen? Sellers will offer discounts. Um, which is code word for just lowering the price. So we'll see P go down. And then as P goes down, more people are going to want to buy, right? That's the law of demand. So Q QD will go up. And then also because of the law of um, supply, we'll see QS go down. Because now some people who were selling phones are just going to say, hey, it's not worth it. I'll just keep it, do something else with it, disassemble it for parts and sell the parts. Who knows? And as QD moves up and QS moves down, eventually we get to a point where they're equal. And that is what we called downward pricing pressure. The other possibility was that we could have Q D greater than QS. And in that case, we'll have a whole bunch of people trying to trying to buy. Um, so this would be like when people queue up to buy, say, um, you know, rent control department in New York, right? Everybody wants one. They queue up in years long lines and try to get on lists, try to get these five hundred dollar a month apartments. But there's hardly any of them available. So what's what would we expect to happen? Well, we'll we'll expect to see sellers raise prices. So P up. Uh, the reason we don't see that in Manhattan is because of the rent control, right? You can't raise the price. It's illegal, so it just doesn't happen, and we have this persistent shortage. But in a normal market, we'll see what, that when we have a shortage, sellers are going to raise that price. As price goes up, demand cuts back. That's the law of demand. Supply increases because now people see that, supposing there wasn't rent control, hey, I can get a lot of money from renting out apartments. Let's build some new ones, or let's add some floors to an old building. So the quantity supplied will go up, and as the quantity supplied goes up and the quantity demanded goes down, you're going to come back toward an equilibrium where QS equals QD. And we called this upward pricing pressure. So the combination of downward pricing pressure pushing you down, upward pricing pressure pushing you up, is going to push you towards that equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity, or QS equals QD. But what is, you know, what, what's the other possibility if you have trade? If you have trade, suppose you have QD greater than, or QS greater than QD. So now, if we didn't have trade, we'd have the, our same old argument. QS greater than QD, so sellers are going to lower their prices to get to, to equilibrium. Let me, wait. Oh, I wrote this wrong. I put it in the wrong spot. QS greater than QD. But if you're open to trade, then you can just go overseas and get more stuff, right? Or you can go overseas and sell your stuff. So if sellers see that QS is greater than QD, and they're going to have all this excess supply, they're just going to go overseas and sell it. So they can export it. Let me write that in blue. That's important. So we'll just see exports if QS greater than QD. So it's okay to have QS greater than QD. That's fine. It just means you're exporting all the excess overseas. And then conversely, it's also okay to have uh, QD greater than QS, you don't need to raise the price, you don't need to have upward pricing pressure. You can just import more stuff so that everybody can buy as much as they need. So trade basically breaks down this whole close connection between QS and QD. They don't need to be equal anymore. They're two separate quantities that you need to think of as kind of separate entities. Um, and the separation between them is the whole trade thing. It's either imports or exports. So now we can get more specific about, we said we're going to import or export when we're trading, but we didn't say at what price. 
And in all of our models, we'd like to be specific about stuff like that. So we made this small country assumption, um, and we modeled the world here on the left. This is the entire world, hence the uh, W subscripts or everything. And then this is the small country, we'll call it SC. This is South Carolina. We'll pretend South Carolina is its own independent country. So in the world market, we see that there's some price PW determined right here. And then we see that they're selling, uh, what, a billion units here in equilibrium. And then over here in South Carolina, it's a tiny little country. You know, all the numbers here are like one, two, three, four, five, six. So, so this market is really tiny compared to this big market. And basically what we said is that it's so tiny that it's basically irrelevant. If we added South Carolina to the world, it would change the demand and supply curves because you'd have to add in this supply to this one and this demand to this one. But you can see how if you add in a demand of like four units here at this price, uh, and this is a billion or close to it, because right, this is a billion, so this is something close to a billion, you're not going to be shifting this demand curve out very far, and you're not going to be shifting this supply curve very much either. So you're not going to affect the world price at all. It's still going to be this equilibrium point right here. So for that reason, we're just going to take this world price as given. Um, you know what? I didn't draw this right. Um, so we'll just take this world price as given and bring it over to the market over here. And often we'll make it a solid line, just for the hell of it. And keep the label PW, because it's the world price. And then we can see that at that world price, this is the amount that sellers want to produce. They want to produce four, because if they're only going to get paid P world, they're only going to supply that much. That's what our spike curve tells us. And consumers will want to buy that th this much, six, if the... Um, world price of whatever price that is prevailed. That's what the demand curve tells us. And then we have a gap between the two. And like we said before, whenever we have QD here six greater than QS here four, we're just gonna import the difference. So these, so this blue area is gonna be imports. So you can see visually what we, what we thought through intuitively and logically on the previous slide, we can see visually on the graph. You might say that the graph's kind of useless um, and that would be true. Uh, you know, it's kind of just like an antiquated thing they did in the 30s and 40s back when people couldn't do calculus. And we kind of kept that tradition alive here at Harvard. They don't do this at MIT, in case you were wondering. So our main lesson from studying trade is that when you're trading, QD will not equal QS. If they do equal each other, it means you're not importing and you're not exporting, so you're just not trading. And this has two important implications. The first is that you have to track QD and QS separately. So you can't just find one Q star anymore. Uh, if, I, if you say, like, the market quantity when you're trading is 5, that's great, but it's kind of meaningless. In which market are you talking about? Are you talking about the amount we produced as a whole or just the amount we produced and sold domestically and excluding the exports? Um, you'll occasionally see problems that make reference to the market, and those are just really bad questions that are ambiguous, um, and there's special rules you use to figure out what the hell the speaker's saying, because, um, you know, it really doesn't make any sense. And the second is that since supply and demand are sort of like disconnected, so right, QD and QS are no longer equal, we said when we did taxes that you had to, like, share the burden, the burden would be shared between the demand and the supply sides of the economy. But since here they're not connected by that market equilibrium anymore, taxes will only affect the side you put them on, um, which we call statutory incidents. So if you make a statute, which is where the name comes from, that says producers will pay a tax of $1, usually that's going to cause the price to go up, and then consumers are going to bear some of the burden, suppliers are going to bear some of the burden. But here, if you place it with trade, if you place a you know a statute that says a one dollar tax on producers, the entire burden of that tax will be uh, you know go on, go on producers, and consumers will have um, no burden from that tax. Their price will not change at all. The amount they consume will not change at all. Uh, all they'll do is just do a little more importing from overseas. So now the one case where this whole thing about how QS and QD don't match up that gets complicated is with quotas. Students hate quota questions. They think they're really difficult. Um, 
There is a helpful hint about this, so I suggest you read that. So, you know, go read that helpful hint. But if, but if you want the real quick and dirty version, a quota just tells you that you can only import, say, five units, or you can only export, say, five units. So there's only two things you need to do. First, check if it's binding. Check. If you're importing units and I put an export quota on, that's not going to be binding. You don't want to export anything, so it really doesn't matter what the quota says uh, about exports. Um, odds are, if we ask you about a quota, it will be binding, because it would be a really dumb question otherwise. I like dumb questions. They test whether you know what you're doing much better than so-called hard questions, but it's tradition at Harvard to give you formulaic, quote, hard questions than, uh, you know, easy questions that test your understanding. And then the second thing is you just use the equation QD equals QS plus the quota. So if it's an export quota, sorry, if it's import quota, you know that you're going to uh, demand some amount and supply some amount, quantity supplied is some amount, and then you can have a difference between the two through imports but only up to that quota. And presumably since it's binding, you're exhausting the entire quota. So you just add on X for imports. So this is for imports. And then the other possibility is that you could have QD plus X equals QS. This would be for exports because um, you're going to demand some amount and then you're going to export some amount and the two of those will sum up to the amount supplied. So you build this and then there's two uses for it. You can sell it locally or you can export it and the two need to add up. The key here, though, is that you can only export so much, right? X is the, the maximum amount you can export. So once this hits, say, 5, the, the, the quota limit, QD and QS will have to adjust to make the rest of the equation true. And that's why they're not totally disentangled from each other. You still need to use these types of equations. Um, pretty similar to a, to a standard like market problem that I know you all know how to do real well, so let's do, uh, let's do a quick example. Say we had QD equals 3 minus P, QS equals P. And there's an import, uh, there's a quota of one import, so we're only allowed to import one. So the first thing to do is to check that this binds. Uh, so the way you do that is you just check what would happen if we didn't have any quotas at all. It would be 3 minus P. Oh, we didn't give you a world price, so you can't check that. Okay, so just take it for given that it binds. And now we just use the equation. So this is the import case, so we're using QD equals QS plus X. We know X is 1 because we were told that. So we have 3 minus p equals p plus 1. And then we can solve. So we rearrange. We get 2 equals 2p. So then we can solve. We see p is, let me, let me make this in uh, some, some green. So you know p is 1. qd then we plug back in. p is 1. So qd is going to be 2. And qs is going to be 1. And then these don't match, so is that a problem? No, right? We're trading. It's okay that they're different, but they can only be different by the one unit imported. Um, so it's good. Two minus one is one, so that leaves one unit left over as an as a, as a, um, import. So in summary, the whole thing about trade is that QD is not equal to QS. That opens up the possibility that it signifies that you're importing or you're exporting, depending on which one is bigger. When you're doing a problem about trade, always look for QD and QS, not just one. Don't just find, quote, the market Q. You need to know how much you're building and how much you're consuming so you know how much you have to import or export. Taxes are special when you do trade. They only affect the side you place them on. This is very important when you're dealing with externalities, um, which we'll talk about in a future video. And then quotas are simple. They look difficult, they're not in the textbook, but they're in a helpful hint. And even though a helpful hint kind of overcomplicates things, because if you just do the simple algebra using common sense to set up the equation, you'll always get the right Q, the right P, and then be able to draw the right diagram. Thanks for watching. Hopefully um, you're pretty well prepared for the test at this point. If not, it's probably time to hit the panic button.